It's actually climbing Mount Shasta. Guess what? It's still on my bucket list. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. But little did I know how this mountain right here would end up tying me and our guest speaker together 50 years later. Um, Jim Geiger is our, our speaker tonight, and it's amazing what, uh, how much we have in common with, with a beautiful, this beautiful mountain. So it's been on my bucket list for a long time. Well, instead of climbing Mount Shasta, I decided, hey, let's do something a lot bigger than this. So this year, I went to Mount Everest Base Camp, okay, which is about 4,000 feet higher than, than Mount Shasta. Don't ask me why, I have no idea, but, but, but I did. When you, when you train for um, going to Mount Everest Base Camp, which is a little under 18,000 feet elevation, it's about 4,000 feet lower than, than Mount Shasta, um, they recommend having about six months to train for this. I made the decision to do it in two and a half months. Um, and so I had to get ready very, very, very quickly. But what I want to share, just a couple of quick stories with you and some lessons that I actually learned as I was preparing for this most amazing, amazing journey. One of the first lessons that I learned, uh-oh. One of the first lessons I learned is a quote by Ben Franklin. By failing to prepare, you prepare to fail. It is so true. It doesn't matter what we're doing in our life. If we don't go into something, especially something that we've never done before, if we don't go into that task without being very well prepared, what ends up happening? A lot, lot higher probability that we can fail. So I had two and a half months to get ready for this trek. It's about an 80-mile 80, uh, 80 round-trip trek. You start at 8,000 feet elevation. Um, go up to about 18,000 feet, but through, throughout, you're actually, um, even though you're climbing 10,000, between just all the ups and downs of all the mountain um, ranges, you're actually climbing about 20,000 feet in, in total. So as I'm getting ready for this, I felt like this guy right here. And I promise you, this isn't, this wasn't me. But, but I'm out there training, and I've got my Subway sandwich in one hand, and I'm running with the other, and it was really wasn't me. But I, I felt like this guy. Because I had so much to do in such a short amount of time. I had a good friend of mine who, um, who I talked, with, uh, talked to about with, uh, regarding the, the track. He said, you know, there's someone that I met a while back that I want you to meet. He said, this, is, uh, this gentleman lives in Sacramento. And he, was att he attempted to be the oldest American to ever summit Mount Everest. In fact, he was also uh, would have been the first great-grandfather to summit Mount Everest as well. And that's where I met Jim Geiger for the very first first time. So we met uh, met for lunch in downtown Sacramento. Um, I was so excited to meet him and just hear his story. I'm going to share a quick story with you. As I walked in, I look at the menu and they say, I'm going to really impress this guy. He was just in amazing shape. 70 years old, amazing shape. So I ordered salmon over a bed of lettuce, no dressing, not a bath. And he ordered lunch. His lunch came, so I had my salmon and salad and everything. His lunch came. And it was crab cakes with french fries. <laughs> Go, I said, wait a minute, I want to do that. How do you, how do you look like that and you're eating like that? He told me that the french fries actually came on, came on accident. So, so we talked for about two hours. And the first lesson he told me, he says, Jeff, what's your plan? So I told him what I was thinking about doing. He said, no, 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 no. You've got it all wrong. In fact, you only have two and a half months to do this. So we started working together. He, and he told me at that point, he said, you know what? I'll coach you. I'm going to help you get ready for whatever space camp. Um, so here's a picture of, of uh, Jim in the Sacramento Bee just before he was about to take off on his adventure to, to Mount Everest Space Camp. This was in April of 2014 that Jim was, uh, the Jim guy who was actually going to, to Nepal. Um, unfortunately, a couple of weeks later, during this venture, this is Jim. Um, you may have heard of the, uh, the ice avalanche that killed the 16 Sherpa um, in Nepal in 2014. Jim was actually up on the mountain at that time, which we'll share the story with you in just a, just a moment. Um, so a few days later, this is Jim actually at the memorial lighting candles for the 16 Sherpa that, that, were, that were killed. So Jim and I started working together, we put together a plan. So I trained six days a week. Now this was, I started in January, the trek was in, later in, in March. Um, and of course I'm usually in the office six to seven each, each morning. So this means that I'm, as I'm training, I've got to get up on the mountains Okay. Usually I was right under the Forest Hill Bridge going up the, the climbing hill there. Usually up there by 4.30 or 5 in the morning. It was so dark and rainy. I'd see little reflections. There were little signposts. I thought there were two little eyes looking at me and I was about to get eaten and that kind of, 
that kind of stuff. Um, and so I trained hard for um, for two and a half two and a half months. We put together an equipment um, equipment plan as well. I needed all the right gear um, going to Everest to make sure that um, we you know, address the proper layers. I hired a nutritionist as, as well to get me ready. By the time I got to Everest, I'd actually uh, actually lost about 25 pounds in total. It was probably the best shape that I've ever that I've ever have been in. But I wouldn't have been in that kind of shape without a phenomenal plan, but also without a great coach helping me as well. So here I am with my son, uh, my 14-year-old son, Seth. Uh, we did all kinds of different treks and, and hikes. I went snowshoeing up in the mountains to try to get used to higher elevations as well. Um, there at the top, that's up at the top of a Mount Diablo. We went on a, on a hike with, with Jim up there. And then it was time to go. So this was the end of, end of March. And we took off for, for Nepal. One of the greatest lessons that I learned on this, um, on this journey is this one right here. Life is a journey, not a destination. Life is a journey, not a destination. And I'll never forget my first couple of days as we're hiking, okay? And we're climbing. What's the, what's the hardest thing to do at higher elevations? Free. Free, right? So the whole time as we're, as we're hiking along was slow and steady. Slow and steady. My eyes were looking on the, at the ground the whole time. Okay? Make sure I'm not tripping on anything. I quickly learned, so the, the whole time, we're just trying to get to the destination of Everest Space Camp. I was missing the whole, the whole point, right? Just stopping and smelling the roses and looking at the beauty ahead of us. You know, so for example, this was one of the first suspension bridges that I saw, okay? You see all the people going, going across. Now, here's a, this is a great example of not staring down at your feet. Because <laughs> when you see, all you see is, is down. But I remember stopping on, um, on one of the first bridges here. This one right here. I remember stopping and just taking it all in and looking all around, looking at the beautiful mountains, the trees were still below the tree line. Just absolutely gorgeous. So how many of us go through life where we don't stop and smell the roses? Because life is truly a journey and not a destination. One of the top things I brought back with me every single day, I just take a moment and I'm grateful for what we have. And I tell you what, especially when you come back from a third world country like that, we have, the, we have so much here. We have so much here that we take for granted that, that so many people in the world don't. And it's so, so important to appreciate that each and every single day. The, the Himalayas are absolutely beautiful, and especially the higher you, you climb, the more beautiful it gets. So a couple pictures just of us there. We realize, uh, of course, as you're climbing, you realize just how small we are in this universe, right? Um, we look like little, little ants here against the majestic, beautiful, beautiful mountains. Probably one of the toughest days I've ever had in my life is uh, and, and some of you may have read my blog. I, I've got the, uh, the, the website up here in a moment that you can write down if you'd like. Um, one of the toughest days I've ever had in my life was the day that we actually went to base camp. Um, so we, we uh, that particular day, we trekked 18 miles um, at elevations between 14,000 and 18,000 feet. Um, it was a long, grueling day. And I ended up uh, getting altitude sickness that day as well. And so there was a period of time there where I wasn't sure if I was going to make it or not. All this training, all for not. Jim's going to talk about it a little bit later. You know, we had a great question the other evening. Someone asked, you know, how much of it is physical versus mental? But you know, when you get to that point, it's very, very mental. Um, and for those of you, and there's a lot of you that are very active, you know this. You get to a point where you think you're done and you can't do anymore. Um, but you keep pushing, pushing forward. And we kept pushing forward. And, uh, and, and here we are. We represented the board by Nature Group very, very well uh, this day, this day in April. If you haven't um, read our blog, I love, I encourage you to, to do it. I've got a lot of wonderful life lessons in there. It's, it's uh, very motivational um, and inspirational as well. But the, uh, the blog is at the bottom. It's www.theboardjourney.wordpress.com. And when you go on, just go to the very beginning. Um, and I actually write every single day about the adventure. So our, our top 
topic today is life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Now, it's interesting because I certainly, people have asked, asked me all the time, well, you must do things like this. I have never even thought about doing anything like this in, in my life. And sort of my feeling is that if I could do it, anyone can. Okay? We have several of, our, several of our clients over here. I'm not going to point out anyone here tonight, but we have one particular client who's 86 years old that's sitting at this table that I'm not going to point at right now, <laughs> who is to, until she just covered her head. Totally, you, you guys are my inspiration, though. Here I am in my early 50s, and I see some of you that are, you're just, the, you're the epitome of success in this area. It's like, um, and it's like, how do you stay so young? Because you're staying active. Okay? You're young here, right? And that's what the key is. Um, but you think about it, how many people that you, how many people do you know that live right here in the comfort zone all the time? 90% of the U.S. population lives in their comfort zone. Okay? So they make excuses. You know, the top thing they say is, what if I fail? What if I don't make it? And you're going to hear tonight from Jim. Jim failed just as many times or even more than he was successful, but he kept giving up and brushing himself off. So they live a mediocre life. They're just surviving. They're just getting by. But what if it doesn't have to be this way? What if it doesn't have to be this way? What if we can live a very, very fulfilling life, especially for those of you who are retired? What if we can be happy and, and, and live a, a life full of fulfillment, prosperity, where we're thinking the sky is the limit, we can do absolutely anything, live some of our dreams. Even if we don't make it to the ultimate goal, remember, it's all about the journey, not just the, the destination. So our goal tonight is to, to share with you some, some import, inspirational stories, but also some keys for you to take home with you that you'll be able to, to practice at, at home to help you hopefully live um, an even more inspirational life your, yourself. You know, it's, it's interesting, and we've talked, Jim and I have talked about this, this a lot. Um, all of us have our everyday errors, right? Um, it could be, you know, the retirement errors. For those of you who are still working, it could be a professional ever. Maybe it's a, you know, our Everest happens to be our health. Maybe we're having some, some different types of, of health issues. Maybe just getting out there and doing a little bit more exercise might be our, our Everest. But maybe some relationship type issues with, with family. Um, could be financial issues as well. Um, even relationship Everest. The one thing that all of us have in common is one word. You know what that word is? Struggle. We all have different struggles, and many times we never know what someone else's struggle is, right? But I bet everyone in this room, at some point in your life, you've had your own everyday efforts. You've had your own struggle that may fit into, into one of these categories here. You know, when you, when you go to a, when you go on a trek, for example, to base camp, you know, the trek to base camp and back takes about two weeks. You get to base camp, what do you do? You take some pictures, you've arrived, you've made it. Okay. Or some of these summits efforts, it might take them about two months. They get to the top, they take some pictures. Of course, they're not celebrating until they get all the way back down. They get in two. But once you're done, it's done. Right? How about the everyday efforts? Are those ever done? They continue on and on and on. Right? Um, and so our goal tonight is to share some stories with you, but also to share some, some strategies and tactics that hopefully you can take home with you to help you with your own everyday efforts, um, the types of struggles that you encounter every single day. So with that, um, please join me in a warm welcome for Jim Geiger. Thank you, Mr. Jeff. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good to see you. Glad to be here. Uh, tonight I want to share with you, like Phyllis mentioned, my story. And uh, there's a lot of, like you said, a lot of failures, but also a lot of successes, a lot of lessons. And then just a, a, a time period where I was kind of contemplating what's going on with my body. Uh, from age 30 on, 40, 50, 60, we all experience all these things happening to our bodies. And that's what I'm going to talk about at the end, is these age world principles that I've learned through time that has helped me to age well. And that's what I want to share with you. And 
Jeff and I put this talk in here to bring you all together so we can all have a discussion about this and you know, maybe we can all learn something. Because I learned from you guys, you learned from me as well. So as a life coach, I get coached by my clients. It's an interesting concept, but that's what happens. But first of all, I'm going to start with this canvas. This is me on the Maui, but we're going to talk about how I got here. This is Mount Everest. Are there any climbers in the room? Mountaineers? Hikers? Yeah, I raised my hand. Okay, good. We have something in common. Mount Everest is 29,035 feet high. And it takes almost like just said, it takes over two months to climb this thing. I was on this mountain during that avalanche. And I'll talk about it in a little bit. But the big question is that I get all the time, what? why do you do this? Why do you climb mountains? You're insane. And I, I get this question all the time. <clears throat> and years ago, I would, I would hear, well, you do it because it's big. Well, that's not even the answer, no. Um, and I struggled with the answer for a long time. And eventually there was one that said, well, I'd like to see it at the top. That didn't make much sense. And then there was other ones like, I want to see if I can still do this. As I got into my 60s, can I still do this? This was a pretty good motivator. See if I can still do it. But this quote that I saw here, I, don't, I wish I knew who it was, but it says, unless you want to take something which the outcome is uncertain, you never know how far you can really go. And that started getting to more of what it was for me. Is it, you just don't know. What's it is going to happen? Because the mountain lets you climb it, and you have to have to struggle through all of the various avenues to get up to the top. Weather conditions, rocks, ice falls, etc., glaciers. So this this starts getting at that question, and I'll have a little bit more answers at the end. Now, climbing and mountaineering, I get accused of being a rock climber a lot. This is not what I do. This is not even close to what I do. There's no way I'm going to do this. But the uh, guy standing out the cliff is, is a far thing from my mind. And they're sleeping out overnight on the side of this mountain. Um, that's not my sport. And I don't know how these guys do this. These are mountain goats. I wish I was like that. That would be awesome. I've been accused of being a mountain goat by my friends, but I'm not anyway, like, like this. So this is what I do. This is called mountaineering. We're roped together. I got this, this equipment on here. We're all roped together with a long rope. And this keeps us safe in case one slips. We can arrest that person, and they're not going to fall. And I brought the ice axe when I came in. That's the ice axe that goes along with this. This is me. 1946, year and a half old, and I am on my first mountain. I wish I would have had my arms in there like this. <laughs> this is my backyard in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So the real question is, how did a guy from Wisconsin, who hit, there's no mountains for thousands of miles around, how did a guy from Wisconsin ever come to climb Mount Everest? And you'll see there's a lot of accidental things that happen, kind of serendipitous things that happen along the way. And you saw this one before, Mount Shasta. I didn't see this mountain until I was 35. I think Shasta was just slightly born after, before that. So, anyway, 35 years later, we come together because of this mountain. And then I met Steve. I accidentally moved next to this guy when I was 40. And he just happened to be a climber, a career, I should say. And he's, he suggested that we go to the best place in the wilderness. Let's go hiking home. Okay. So this by accident, I moved next to this friend of mine now, and uh, we climbed the other peak in Desolation Wilderness. Anybody ever been there? Good for you. You clicked to the top? Awesome. No. Well, yeah, good. It's a four mile, four thousand foot climb, so it's a pretty difficult. It's a good training though. And so we went on this, and I, I just, I liked myself getting to the top. It was kind of fun. Oh, here we go. 
And then, of course, Mount Shasta became my first Everest. This was on my bucket list now. And Steve said, we're going to go climb Mount Shasta. And yes, I will. This is for me. I had no idea how long it would take. And so the first time I went there, didn't make it. The next two times, didn't make it. Finally, when I was 49, I got to the top of my first Everest. So it took me nine years and three field attempts to get to the top, along with the training for it and getting prepared to make this climb. So the big lesson to take away here is expect a worthwhile goal to take some time out. It just doesn't happen by chance. What happens after you turn 49 the next year? You turn 50, right? Everybody remember that? Yeah. Almost everybody in this room remembers that, that, that um, age. Well, I decided that there was going to be something big that I want to do for my 50s. Well, what was that? What would that be? Another mountain. Yeah, Mount Rainier. Well, I thought it was a mountaineer. Although, Mount Rainier is much different than Mount Shasta. And so the, the next year when I went to Mount Rainier, I didn't know what I was in for. And it was a rude awakening, because I barely got back down. And this is how I felt at the bottom. Well, about halfway down, I felt like this was going to collapse. My legs were like rubber, you know, and nothing was working, and I just wanted to get down this mountain. This is how I felt when I finally flopped into my bed at the, at the hotel. I really did the next morning. But then I went back home to Sacramento, and have you all ridden over the Forest Hill Bridge? Well, at the bottom, or on the side of that bridge, is this hill. Uh, it goes from the confluence up to the top of the bridge and beyond up to the, you know, raise up the top. So I went to this hill every Saturday morning and climbed it a couple of times. It was about a thousand feet and about a half a mile. It was very steep. First time I did it, I was on my hands and feet picking up this thing. And I finally got up there, and then I kind of was able to do it without my hands, and I kept on going back. And I worked on the 15th floor of the research building in Sacramento, night and home. Um, and I, so I walked from the first floor to the 15th floor in my office every day. Went back on the hill on Saturday, just did that for 20 years. And I finally, back after the 10th year, I was finally feeling like, okay, my legs don't kind of collapse like they did on the rear anymore. So I, I felt I had a face going. Still not having any idea of what's going on in, in, in the mountaineering world. I had no idea. I wasn't thinking of Everest at that time. But well, why do you think I would want to go to the training board on Saturday? Well, this is what I set for me in your goal. I wanted to be able to lead a climb of Mount Whitney every year. And that's what kind of kicked me out of bed every Saturday morning to go up to this training hill and get ready. So I could lead these people up this mountain. Well, the guy on Rainier, who took me up on Rainier, was an international mountain guy. He would climb all over the world and he kept sending emails. This is the first inkling I ever had about leaving the country, about climbing other things in, in the world. Um, I was still much in awe of these mountains, but I had no intention of going any other place on my own, and it took me three years before I said yes to going to the Tillman Journal, and I love it. There's one of those things that you just never imagined that could be as wonderful as it really is, it really is. And so the mountain became a destination to go on a safari, you know, to see different cultures I hadn't seen before, the Maasai were just wonderful people. But the mountain was why I went, and uh, that was a big part of what had changed my life. I now realize that going to these other uh, other mountains was something that I would now see other cultures and, and, and enjoy other scenery and see things I've never seen. So I made it to the top of Tillman Jar, 1999. And at age uh, 56, a couple years later, Right, the same guy invited me to go to base camp, and we supported him to, on his effort to get to the top of his clients. 
I just want the taste of it. So I experienced the same thing in Jeff did with this 40 mile trek to base camp. But we, unlike other trekking companies, we were able to stay at base camp two nights. I wish I had to make that decision. But for the first time, I had a sleep sitting up, breathing. So that was like, it felt like I was going to pass out. But the second night, I had acclimated a little bit and I slept pretty good. A couple years later, I went to uh, Russia, and, and I, even though I had flying from Kilimanjaro, I was not prepared for the ice and snow stuff, and um, we, we didn't use the harness and, and this on, on Kilimanjaro, but on Elvis we did. And so I started getting the technical part of mountaineering, and I realized I don't know what I'm doing. I was fumbling with my equipment, I was trying to get pants on over my crampons, which was a big mistake, and just loved everything up, and uh, I was about 30,000 feet from the top, and I said, the wind was starting to blow, and getting very cold, and so I said, I'm going to go back down. And I went back down. Came back the next year, I trained for a year, how to put all this stuff on properly, and I got to the top. So a little point here that I think is, and you'll see more failures coming along, but what I started realizing, it doesn't say anything about me if I failed. I just didn't do it, didn't make it. And it doesn't say anything about my future. I can go back and, and knock it off again, so I need to. So failures, and for me, became a very good lesson in, in, uh, in how to do life, because there's going to be failures all along the way. So I just get up and dust myself up and keep on going. That's the whole point. So you feel. Age 59, off the wars out of Mexico. Let me climb this one. And I, then I started breaking up by myself. I went with some friends down to Cotopaxi in Ecuador, and uh, we took this picture from well, this in Norte, and uh, I just love this shot of Cotopaxi. But the next day when we climbed it, total whiteout. Couldn't see the cold air when we got to the top. We look into this abyss, and there's nothing but just clouds. But we were glad we saw this mountain in the distance. It was beautiful, gorgeous. Went back a couple of years later, failed all three. High winds on Cambi blew us all off. I got sick on Cotopaxi, uh, and I was still sick for Chimborazo, so. But we were there and we went to the Galapagos. It's another good excuse to go to these wonderful places. The, the first year we went there, when we did Cotopaxi, 